Let's begin by, by reviewing the word sustainable. It's, it's a word that's typically seen today nearly everywhere. It's ubiquitous. But, but rarely, if ever, do I find that the word sustainable is, has food choice properly positioned in any sustainability efforts. For instance, for, for most, the word sustainable relates more to the energy sector uh, or to waste or even to economic or social sustainability. The difficulty is, is that the, and th those all are important to understand, but the difficulty is, is, that, is that animal agriculture, specifically uh, how it affects uh, in terms of our environment, is the leading concern for our sustainability as a species and also for sustainability of other species that we share this planet with. So not only has it become a, uh, a concern that sustainability doesn't properly position livestock or animal agriculture in general into the equation, but so there's a disconnect there, but we're, we're now moving into the uh, direction of uh, where uh, we're placing more emphasis on fossil fuels and waste and therefore the gap is becoming even greater. This is, this is seen in an exaggerated sense with climate change because the focus internationally has been that climate change is real and it's, it's urgent, of course, but it's primarily related to fossil fuels. When, in fact, minimally 14.5% of all anthropogenic or human-induced greenhouse gas emissions are caused from the uh, animal agriculture industry. And so, and also, typically the, uh, the projections of those uh, involved in, in climate change policy making uh, have, ign have ignored uh, those, the, the, uh, uh, the component created by animal agriculture. So that, uh, but, the, but the calculations are there that if in fact we eliminated all fossil fuel use today, we would, we would still exceed our maximum uh, amount of greenhouse gas emissions that is considered allowable in our, in our atmosphere uh, by the year 2050, uh, just principally due to uh, animal agriculture, pr primarily because uh, livestock contribute over seven gigatons of greenhouse gases per year and uh, on their own, and it's expected to increase from 50% to 200% uh, by the year uh, 2050. So uh, again, even if we eliminated all fossil fuel use today, we would still exceed our budget, what's allowed for the maximum amount of uh, greenhouse gases in our atmosphere by the year 2050, just because of the production of livestock. So most, most climate change scientists agree that we need to drastically reduce our greenhouse gas emissions uh, by the year 2020. By, and by drastically reduce, they mean by cutting in half. And we're at about 54 gigatons of greenhouse gases being emitted per year right now. And um, it's, it's, by all estimates, it, it seems nearly improbable, if not impossible, that we'll be able to reduce uh, our greenhouse gas emissions by half. Um, because most of the focus, again, is on fossil fuels. Uh, but uh, if we, for instance, there are models that exist today that display very clearly that if we simply converted all cropland uh, that's currently being used to grow feed crops for livestock, and at the same time we converted all pasture land that's being currently used for grazing livestock in the world, we converted those lands to purely plant-based systems and, and agroforestry, meaning we, and because they're so efficient uh, to use in terms of land efficiency, uh, I mean, they can grow up to 20 to 50 times more food on one acre of land uh, versus uh, with plant-based foods versus with animal products. So because of their efficiencies, uh, if we converted all those, all those lands to purely plant-based systems for uh, producing food for us to eat directly, there are models showing that uh, all greenhouse gases produced by all sources today could be mitigated, uh, meaning they would be sequestered into our, into our soil uh, without, uh, without, the li without uh, fossil fuels even be factored into the equation at all, uh, just by changing the, uh, the livestock patterns into plant-based systems. It's a pretty powerful uh, statement. Additionally, uh, uh, our tropical rainforests 
uh, and oceans are affected in, in climate change and in ways that uh, are detrimental long term. For instance, our, our oceans produce over 50% of the oxygen that we breathe for rainforest, tropical rainforest in particular, especially in the Amazon area, produce over 20% of oxygen that we breathe, and yet we're, we're, we're damaging both of those uh, uh, oxygenation systems and climate regulatory systems that we have because of our desire to produce uh, uh, food for us to eat from the animal agricultural sector. Um, and specifically, when you're talking about livestock, they already comprise 45% of the entire land mass on Earth, and uh, growing and, and raising livestock and then slaughtering them and eating them is producing greenhouse gases that are affecting not only our atmosphere but they're then affecting our oceans because our oceans are taking that excessive amount of carbon uh, dioxide and warmth and uh, trying to buffer it and so our oceans have become more acidic and warmer uh, at a faster rate, especially in terms of acidification than they've, than they've become in uh, the last uh, uh, 300 million years. Um, now, we are currently in overshoot mode uh, with our planet, meaning that uh, it would require about uh, 1.6 Earths to sustain what we're currently taking from and doing to our planet. We've been in overshoot mode since 1973. And in the United States, it would require five full Earth Earths to support our current lifestyle. And the single sector, the single reason for this unsustainability across all aspects of those, uh, those measurable, uh, quanti quantifiable uh, uh, areas of, or uh, concerns of unsustainability, the most single uh, culprit responsible for our, for our unsustainability is because of the food we eat. It's because of the livestock uh, that we raise and eat on land and because of the fish we're extracting out of our oceans and the habitat that we're destroying. So the single most important thing that we can do to ensure our sustainability on Earth for our species and other species that we uh, share this planet with is to eliminate meat, dairy, and fish from our diet. Now, it has been over the years uh, a topic that has been uh, difficult to accept. It's been difficult to discuss by a number of uh, authors and uh, leaders in this in this uh, area or this uh, concern, because uh, it's been difficult uh, from a cultural and uh, society uh, standpoint. It's been difficult to accept because it, it cuts through uh, various cultural uh, barriers. The difficulty that we have now, though, is that if we if we don't if we don't change our diets and do so very quickly that it's, it's, it's creating this uh, path or this uh, motion towards uh, losing resources that sustain us. In fact, we are now, we've reached the Anthropocene area where we've uh, acquired the power to negatively change our biosphere, the, the litho and hydro and atmosphere, the very environs that sustain us and sustain all other life on Earth. The difficulty is, is that we haven't acquired the maturity or the wisdom in, to manage this this power in a beneficial or sensible manner. So my concern is, is that in the past, we have been looking at uh, our, our diet or nutrition in terms of uh, uh, what it, how it affects us as, as an individual. Or uh, there have been, uh, there's a solid movement in terms of animal welfare, animal rights, in terms of how our diet might affect those animals that, uh, that we raise for food each year. But my concern is, is that we need to apply now, uh, we need to apply the understanding that we have timelines, very recognizable timelines or tipping points that, are, that, we, that, are, we are confront, that we're confronting. And uh, we are now exceeding those uh, timelines or tipping points. And the only way, that, the easiest way for us to manage that is to, is to change our diet. We've uh, in fact, there are five out of nine recognized uh, tipping points or planetary boundaries have we've already surpassed. And those are the boundaries that uh, a number of renowned international scientists have, met, have identified and quantified uh, where if we stay within these boundaries, 
uh, human existence can uh, prosper uh, for generations to come. If we exceed these, these boundaries or these uh, tipping points or timelines, uh, then uh, it, it changes the, our environment, likely irreversibly so in our lifetime, to where the risk of uh, our sustainability or us uh, living uh, is uh, to the point where we may perish. Many uh, scientists feel that we only have 50 to 75 years even remaining. And that's because many of these boundaries have already been passed. The boundaries that we passed are with climate change and with land use or land system change, as well as some biogeochemical flows such as phosphorus and, and nitrogen, uh, as well as our, our biosphere integrity and extinctions and ocean acidification. All those boundaries we have now passed and are irreversibly damaged in our lifetime. The difficulty is, is with the other four boundaries, uh, there are all nine boundaries are interconnected. All planetary boundaries are interconnected, and as one collapses, the others will soon follow. And we're exceeding, we're moving quickly past the tolerance levels of the uh, other four boundaries. In terms of our sustainability, then, there are a few different approaches, and many simply point their finger at overpopulation. And it's easy to do that because there we have 7.4 billion people living on our planet today with about 240,000 added uh, every single day. So that's net. So control of our own human population is an issue, but it's not nearly so much of a problem as what we're doing to our planet, another type of population, which is that we're raising and slaughtering and consuming 74 billion animals each year on our planet. And that number is growing each year. And that number is also on the, on the light side, because on any given day, you, you may find up to, if you, if you research uh, the numbers correctly, especially in underdeveloped or uh, developing uh, countries, you would find that there are between 1.7 and 2 trillion chickens in the world, and between 1 and 3 trillion fish in the world that on their way, sooner or later, are off to slaughter that one year. Now, the reason the connection between those numbers and our sustainability is the simple fact that in order to raise uh, animals for us to slaughter, then slaughter and consume, it requires resources. It requires land, it requires water, it requires uh, air, and it requires, in many cases, fossil fuel. And so all of these resources combined is what's causing our state of unsustainability in a collective sense greater than any other industry uh, that we have. So knowing that, again, it seems that the easiest solution to our sustainability problem is, you know, continue uh, decreasing our dependence on fossil fuel, continuing our, uh, our need to reduce waste, but the, the method that we can best approach this in the most expedient way possible, because we're on these timelines and exceeding our tipping points, is to do something that's as quick as possible and in terms of a collective sense can create and generate the greatest amount of good for all humans and all beings that we share this planet with, and that is by eliminating, not reducing, but eliminating meat and dairy from our, from our diet. Now, the reason that I, uh, I stress the word elimination uh, is because there are many food movements today that, that the media and the public and policymakers want to perpetuate, which are simply uh, different versions of eat less meat uh, or eat better meat in their eyes. And uh, eating less meat is a very dangerous approach because there is no metric. There is no way to measure what less means. Uh, uh, for instance, if there are uh, 900 million people in the world suffering from hunger, which there are, and uh, you are uh, eliminating meat and dairy from uh, the world and able to uh, shift all the food patterns from animal agriculture uh, to plant-based systems, uh, world hunger would, could easily be eliminated. And that the metric can be uh, zero. We want zero amount of people uh, suffering in the world from hunger, and we want zero amount of unnecessary use of our resources. So eating less meat simply brings the metric into a, a very vague and uh, you know, uh, difficult to, to quantify 
uh, state, and also it continues the perpetuation towards these timelines that we're already on. Uh, a, a good example is the fact that uh, the United Nations has uh, supported and is perpetuating the belief that we just need to eat less meat, and so are a number of other organizations. But eating less meat is uh, not consistent. Again, you, you can't measure it. There's no, no great metric there uh, to eliminate something that's uh, wrong, hurtful, or unnecessary, and which eating less meat is all those things. And so, uh, and also, it, it's inconsistent with the urgency and the magnitude of the problem, and it perpetuates irresponsibility. Uh, so, uh, it also, eating less meat, the, the uh, movement of eating less meat is uh, simply uh, mistakenly shifts the focus to seafood, because many, many uh, people believe that seafood isn't, uh, isn't uh, meat, is not a, not a real animal involved. So it's a very dangerous food movement. The reason that many food movements are, uh, are inadequate or they're not moving us in the right direction is because most of these food movements, except for uh, a fully whole food plant-based diet grown organically, any other food movement that incorporates animal agriculture into their systems is then incorporating, uh, whether admittedly or not, they're incorporating uh, inefficient use of our resources. And so, for instance, if you're buying local, uh, transportation is only responsible for 4% of all the greenhouse gases emitted and all the fossil fuels used in the entire food production process. So uh, buying local uh, really isn't going to help in terms of uh, all of the natural resources that are being depleted uh, worldwide. And so uh, I've always said that I'd much rather buy an organically produced uh, plant-based product from uh, 3,000 miles away than I would an animal product from my next-door neighbor. And that's because of all the resource depletion that occurs by producing any type of, any type of animal product across the board, whether it's uh, in land use inefficiencies or water use or production of methane or greenhouse gas emissions. Uh, so one other uh, quick comment about that is, is that many people believe that uh, if you shift your uh, food focus from, uh, from factory farming to, or industrial farming to grass-fed animal systems, that that's going to solve the problem. In fact, it's going to make it worse because there's more land use changes, there's more deforestation, there's more freshwater usage uh, inefficiencies, and there's more greenhouse gas emissions. And, uh, and so uh, there's difficulty with that, with that movement. In fact, there, uh, a grass-fed cow consumes or produces 60 to 70 percent more methane than uh, a cow that's fed grain. Also, uh, it's uh, it's been an, an arguable point unless you look at the facts. But uh, grass-fed beef also consume more water than uh, grain-fed, and that's because we're looking at water across the board: green water, blue water, gray water, uh, all water types. And also, there's a feed conversion ratio issue. Grass-fed uh, beef or cattle uh, sometimes consumes uh, uh, a feed conversion ratio of 70 to 1, meaning it requires minimally 70 uh, input units, maybe it's pounds, whatever you want to look at, kilograms, uh, but uh, essentially 70 to 1 is the feed conversion ratio for grass-fed uh, beef uh, versus about 8 to 1 of grain-fed versus 1 to 1 for plants. You just simply pluck the plant out of the garden and eat it yourself, and you have a 1 to 1 relationship. 